module, we're uh, going to talk about some of the the, um, the early experiments and um, theories that, that led to our current um, understanding of what's going on in chemistry. So we're going to start with some of the fundamental chemical laws that, that these early scientists figured out. Law of conservation of mass, law of definite proportion, and law of multiple proportions. So here's what they are. Um, the law of conservation of mass just says that mass can be neither created nor destroyed. The way we apply it, well, it's really the same, but two ways in chemistry. Um, one way to apply this in chemistry is just to realize that this tells us that the total mass of all the reactants in a chemical reaction must equal the total mass of all the products that are formed. Um, we also use this um, when we're balancing chemical equations because this right here, the law of conservation of mass, tells us that we have to have the same number of atoms of each element on both sides of the reaction. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do that later. So the law of definite proportion just says that if you have a certain compound, water, or you know, for example, that no matter how much of that compound you have or where you get it, it always has the same proportion of mass of its elements. So, for example, water, there's always um, about one gram of hydrogen for every eight grams of oxygen, no matter how much you have or where you get it. That's that proportion. Now, the law of multiple proportions, that, that takes a little bit more um, explaining, maybe. So, the idea here is that you have... Um, two or more, but we'll just keep it simple. Say we have two elements that form different compounds, you know, compound A, compound B. Um, if we figure out how many grams of one of the elements there is in, um, that combines with one gram of the other element in one compound and do the same thing for the other compound, if we take the ratio of the mass of the first element in both compounds, it should be a ratio of small, or can be reduced to a ratio of small whole numbers. Um, so I think this one right here is best illustrated with an example because it, it's a little bit shaky at first for most people. So let's, let's do an example. So let's say we have two elements, J and D, and they combine and they make two different binary compounds. So with two elements in there, you know, these are imaginary, right? Um, J and D. The first compound, you know, for sample, the uh, a sample of the first compound, it ends up we have set about 17.3 grams of J combining with 22.3 grams of D. The second compound, different compound, we have 12.8 grams of J combining with 9.92 grams of D. We want to show that these support the law of multiple proportions, and it hopefully it'll um, give you a better understanding of what the law of multiple proportions says too. And also we'll be able to do this second part here. Um, let's say, okay, so after we do this, let's say somehow we figure out, or we do another experiment, we find that the formula for the first compound up here is two J's for every five D's. What's the formula for the second compound? All right, so let's do this. So we're going to do this part up here first. Show that it supports the law of multiple proportions. Well, that means that what we want to do is find how many grams of one of the elements we have in each compound for one gram of the second element in each compound. So you can do this either way. I, I chose um, to find out how, much, how many grams of D we have in compound one. So this stands for grams of element D in compound one. Divide it by the grams of J in compound one. If we t do that division, we'll find how many grams of D we have in compound one for every one gram of J in compound one. Okay, that's where that per one gram is in that the definition of the law of multiple proportions. And we do the same thing for compound two. Take the grams of D in compound two, divide by the grams of J in compound two, do the division. We find we have this many grams of D in compound two for every one gram of J in compound two. Now, the second part of that definition says if we take the ratio of the grams of D in compound one for every one gram of J, and divide it by the grams of D in compound two for every one gram of J, or the other way around, doesn't matter, we should be able to reduce that to a, a ratio of small whole numbers. So if we do that, 1.28 sub nine grams of D in one for this many 0.775 grams of D in two, we get 1.66 or so grams of D in one for every one um, 
well, it's grams of DN1 per one gram of DN2, but because now it's the same element, that means we have the same number of atoms of element D in compound one for every one atom of D in compound two. So the law of multiple proportions says that this should be a ratio of small whole numbers or we can reduce it. Well, if you recognize that 1.66 is basically one and two thirds, if we multiply this by three over three, right? We can always multiply anything by one, doesn't change it. Um, we get 4.989 grams of D in one, um, excuse me, atoms of D in compound one for every three atoms of D in compound two. And that's really close to five. That's, we can round that. This is too far away to round. Let's, let's make our rule closer than 0.1 to a whole number to round. Okay, got that? Must be closer than 0.1 to a whole number to round. Well, this is definitely closer than 0.1. We can round it to five. And this, and so now we see that the ratio of atoms of D in compound one to atoms of D in compound two is five to three small whole numbers. We've done it, right? Yay. We have supported the law of multiple proportions. Now let's look at the second part that says that let's say we know the formula for compound one. What's the formula for compound two? That's pretty easy. Look, we know that we have five D's in compound one for every two J's in compound two. And we also know that there are three D's in compound two for every five D's of compound one. Remember, we figured that out when we were proving or, or you know, su supporting the law of multiple proportions. So this tells us that there are three D's in compound two for every two J's in compound one um, with, with those numbers. But remember, through this whole thing, we kept the amount of J the same. So that means that there are also three, there are three D's of, three, excuse me, three D's, Two, uh, three atoms of D in compound two for every two atoms of J in compound two, and that gives us the formula J2D3, and that's that.